Well, I want to ask you a question. How well do you know God? Little Jimmy was seven years old. He was doodling in class. And the teacher said, Jimmy, what are you doing over there? He says, well, I'm drawing a picture. And the teacher said, well, draw, what are you drawing a picture of? He said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, well, Jimmy, nobody knows what God looks like. He says, they will when I get done. <laughs> you know, we have a picture of God. And really, here's the picture. God is spirit. Can you visualize spirit? Well, we can also get a picture of God because Paul gives us one of those pictures of God when he preaches in the book of Acts, when he comes to a place called Athens. And so take your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 17, and we will discover today the answer to the question, how well do you know God? And it begins really with a folly of idolatry. And when you think of idolatry, you must think of what happened last week when we studied together. We, we looked at, do idols still exist today? And we gave the definition of an idol. And an idol is an inanimate object made of wood, stone, gold. And we learned last week that we still, in 2019, we still have some idols in our lives that, that we really have to discard, that we have to get rid of, and get rid of the little G and think about the big G. All right? So he talks about the folly of idolatry. But before we get into 22, I want you to back up with me and look at 16. While Paul waited for them at Athens, watch this, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So when Paul gets ready to come to the hill of Mars, that's what it's actually called, the Areopagus, Mars Hill. What does all of that mean? Well, here's what it means. Paul came in front of people who were discussing and disputing religious questions and issues. Sometimes, those of us who are courageous enough and bold enough, we're able to do that at work. Today, still, we're able to talk about Religious matters. We're able, to, we're able to mention God's name. We're able to talk about Jesus. We're able to mention the church. That's where Paul came. To this group of people who gathered together to want to learn something new. In Paul's sermon on the hill or Mars Hill or Areopagus, what Paul does is he makes several affirmations about God. And, and he really asked those on the hill of Mars, how well do you know God? I mean, personally and intimately, how well do you know God? And really, it's a, it's a good question for us today in our lives to ask ourselves the question, how well do we know the God who is above us? And so what I want to do is I want to go ahead and read 22 to 31. Then I want to go back and share with you five, six, maybe seven things that help us to know God. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, grab one of the pew in front of you and, and follow along as we study together this morning. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. 24, God, comma, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, as he gives to all life, breath, and all things. 26, and he has made from one blood, that'd be Adam, Every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Watch this, 27. That they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. 
For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of all this by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. In this discourse that Paul gives, he is troubled as he looks at that city that's given over to all of those idols. And so he begins this discourse by telling these religious people, how well do you know God? And boom, he comes right out of the gate by saying in verse 24, God is your creator. If I were going to help somebody today to know God as the creator, I would take them to four chapters out of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible. I hope that you'll make a mental note of this or a physical note of these four chapters. Genesis 1. You and I can't go back beyond Genesis 1. In the beginning, God, the four greatest words of the Bible. I would not only go to Genesis 1, but I would go to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I would go to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll do that in just a few moments, which shows us that it is Jesus who is in the beginning at the creation with God. And I would go to Hebrews chapter 1, which teaches us that Jesus is greater than the angels that Jesus was there as the express image of God himself. Those four places I would go. And, and so what, what Paul does in the very outset, in the very beginning, he says you need to understand that these inanimate objects are incapable of creating. God is our creator. Did you read what he said? God who made the world and everything in it. God made the world. God made everything in the world. God is the one who, who, who put into motion the, 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 the seasons and, and, and the way the earth rotates and, and we're just exactly where we need to be as far as the distance from the sun. If we're any closer, we're going to burn up literally. If we're any further away, we're going to absolutely freeze to death. That's the way God has set it in motion. God made the world and everything in it. I love this second aspect that he says that God is not confined to man-made temples or to huge venues that people might build. I'm concerned today that when we leave here, some of us are going to leave God trapped in this building. We don't, we don't realize that God is, is not confined to this place. But, but yet some of us have the concept that I'm coming in here and I'm going to meet God today and I'm going to leave him here the next Sunday. Really? God can't be confined to this space. As we exit this room, God is omnipresent, which means that God has the ability to be anywhere and everywhere. So I want to ask you to let God out of this building today. You know how you are when you're a kid. You, you do things and you're just, you're just silly. When we used to go visit our grandparents, they lived in northeast Arkansas. And my, my grandparents were from that culture where they bought their own cigarette papers. And they rolled their own cigarettes back in that day and time. That's what people did. And they always bought, because I remember the can, they always bought Prince Albert. And old Prince Albert was in that can. And I remember my brother and I, we, we kind of like to play tricks every once in a while. We called up the store when my grandfather bought that stuff. My brother and I, we said on the phone, we said, hey, do you have Prince Albert in the can? They said, yeah, we do. And my brother and I said, you better let him out. 
that's what people want to do with God. They, they want to can God up in, the, in what we call the house of worship. And we not let him out on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Listen, you can't confine God. And that's what Paul was saying right here to these folks in Athens. God is omnipresent. And God is so powerful that he's, he's self-existent. I love verse 25 of Acts chapter 17. Listen to what he says. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. I want to ask you a question. What does God need? Everything is at his disposal. God has it all. What, what does God possibly need? He gives to all life, breath, and all things. So God is self existent, Paul says. There is nothing incomplete about his nature. Ask me a question about God, and I'll tell you that God's nature is holy, pure, just. God's a God of love. God's a God of vengeance. On and on and on. There's nothing incomplete about the nature of God. And Paul's trying to get that message across to these folks who were worshiping these inanimate objects. So he continues to ask these questions and these statements about God. He is the sustainer of life and breath and all things. This is where I would take us to Colossians chapter 1, really 15 through 18. And as we go there, we're going to see that, that it's Jesus who, who holds the universe together, even as we speak today. Colossians chapter 1, look at it with me very quickly, verses 15 through 18 of Colossians chapter 1. And here's what the Apostle Paul says, and you remember this from our study of Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. And verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. I'm here to tell us today, he is the one who holds our universe together, and He is the sustainer. How well do you know God? You know God as the sustainer. But you've heard me say this many, many times, and you'll hear it many, 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 many more times. God is, God is sovereign. What that means is that, that God is over us and above us. It was Jesus who broke down those barriers, the barrier between the Jew and the Gentile, the barrier between the male and the female, the barrier between the slave man and the free man. The slave man, uh, but, but between the barrier between the person who is a barbarian and the person who is sophisticated. Jesus broke down all of those barriers. He is the sovereign one. And if you read Galatians 3, 26 and 20, 28, you'll read that. That by faith we come to know him. As we come to know him, we desire to be baptized. As we desire to be baptized, we see that we are all equal in the church. But yet we all have different roles. And that's why we're studying what we are on Sunday nights. You need to be here for these. God is sovereign. And, and Paul wants those folks to know that those inanimate objects are not like the sovereign God who is above. God is in control. Now don't, don't speak out loud and don't, Raise your hand, but I really want to ask you this question. Do you ever fear World War III? I mean, do you? Do, do you ever fear that because of the sheer number of Muslims in our world, 1.2 billion, that they will somehow, some way or another, infiltrate and take over the United States of America and the United Kingdom? Do you ever worry about those things? What if you do? You need to learn that God is still in control. And even should that transpire take place, or even should that happen, that there will always be a remnant of the people of God, always, always has been and there always will be. 
God is in control. And it's interesting to note that Paul goes on to say something that really gets inside of them in Acts chapter 17. He says, listen, I want you to know this. God is Father. Now, why would that be significant or important? Well, look at verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is like gold, silver, or stone, or something shaped by art and man's devising. You know what Paul did? Paul went like this. I got you right between the eyes. I got your heart on this one. He knew he was talking to folk who believed in all of these inanimate objects, all these statues. He knew he was talking to people like that. But you know what? He said, God's really the Father. God's the one who can move and breathe. God is the one who can take control. God is the one who can feed you. God is the one who can save you. God is the one who can love you. God is the one who can take care of you. And, and here, to me, is one of the most impressive things that Paul does. Paul quotes from their own philosophers and poets. You know how I know that? Verse 18 of chapter 17. He goes back and he talks about the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. And, and, and they were just saying that Paul was a babbler. And look at verse 19. They took him and brought him to the hill of Mars, is what that really means there, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. You're, you're bringing strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. Now watch 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. If you were in my class this morning, you know that we talked about this. If somebody tries to tell you in religion there is some new thing, here's what you have to remember. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. Can I get an amen? I mean, chew on that. Think about that. There is no new thing. Sometimes somebody says, man, I'm going to start, start me a storefront church over here. And we're going to just do some new things. You see, here's what they're going to do. They're going to do things that are not part of the Bible. And you can always do new things if they're not part of the Bible. You can do anything and everything if it's not part of the Bible. We want some, this philosopher said, give us something new. Paul said, I am. I'm telling you about God. God is the Father. And so he kind of clinches it all by talking to them about two final things. One is about worship. And Paul is going to dismiss the concept and the idea of idol worship, of worshiping an inanimate object, of worshiping a statue that's made of gold or silver or wood. Or He's going to dismiss that notion. And he's going to talk about the divine nature. And that divine nature is truly, and I think it would be fair to say this, we say manhood, womanhood. Let's talk about godhood. And so godhead or godhood he says that's who really needs to be worshipped. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so here's where he ends his discourse. He said, hey, sometime God is going to judge you. There was a time, verse 30, that according to man's ignorance, God overlooked, but not anymore. God is commanding all men everywhere to repent to change their mindset, to change the direction of their life, to change where they're going and how they're going and who they're going with. You know why? Verse 31. He's going to ask all men to repent because judgment time is coming. And he has ordained a special judge. You know what his name is? You got your seatbelt on? Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to be the judge. And isn't it exciting to know, when you really stop and think about it, the very one who gave his life for us, the very one who redeemed us, the very one who bought us, is going to be the one who's going to judge us. 
by that man whom he hath ordained, the one who rose from the dead. You know what the good news is about this passage? There were some in this city who turned from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what the scripture says. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. They turned from those idols to serve the living and true God. And so what begs the question is, you know, what, what about us? I want you to look at three or four scriptures in John and then we'll sing our song. All right, you ready for this? John 12 and verse 48, here's what it says. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. So he that rejecteth and receiveth not my word is in a perilous condition, knowing that that very word is going to judge our lives. Be that as it may, let me call your attention to two other scriptures. One is John 14 and verse 6. Incidentally, that's the one that we'll be using on May the 5th. All three lessons will come from that one verse. Jesus is the way. 9.30. Jesus is the truth. 10.30. And Jesus is the life. 1 o'clock. We even need to know that this morning more than ever before. That Jesus is our way. He is the way. He is the life. And He is the truth. And the last one is John 3. In John 3, 16 and 17, we learn that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever would believe on Him would have life. And it would be everlasting. Because God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through Him might be saved. And so I ask us this morning, how well do you know God? Do you know His Son as the Savior of your life? The one who bore His sins on the tree that we might be healed? The one who shed His blood? The one who was innocent? The one who never made a mistake. The one who never did anything wrong. Put your faith in Jesus. Keep your faith in Jesus. Be buried in that watery grave of baptism to know Jesus intimately and personally. You might say, well, you know, preacher, I've done that. And I used to know God pretty well. But you know what? I've let the world come between me and God. Oh, yeah, I have. I've let the things of the world Dictate what I do, where I go, who I'm with. And friend, that can cost you your eternal soul.